We got a big episode of the Shane Inning podcast coming your way with a very special guest. We're going to talk Mets, the way their season has gone, and we'll talk about some other things as well. It all starts right now. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's Doug Williams and Andy Martino with you as always. A reminder to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. We appreciate it. Another reminder that Shane is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon at weeknights, six o'clock on SNY. You can check out Baseball Night in New York. Uh, myself, usually five days a week. Andy, uh, two or three times a week. It's good stuff. We talk all things New York baseball. Uh, without further ado, I want to welcome a, a guest that Andy and I are really thrilled to have. Uh, on this podcast, you know, in, in terms of, of you listening, yes, he's a huge rock star, Julian Casablanca's uh, strokes, voids. He's done a lot of cool solo stuff, constantly busy working on his next project, Lonely Island, Daft Punk. He's everywhere. So that part's cool. But for the sake of this show, he's a huge Mets fan. And um, we got an email before the show about some of the things that Julian was hoping to talk about. Um, I, I would categorize it with just about everything um, with this Mets team, Julian. Um, but I want to begin with this. Who going into this offseason, because the season isn't statistically over, but it's, it's just about there. Who are you hoping the Mets bring in this offseason or retain this offseason? Uh, well, thanks for having me, by the way. Um... I think, uh, I mean, the big, the, the, the two big ones, the, the big decisions, I guess, right, are like um, uh, Syndergaard and Stroman. Uh, they got to come back, right, obviously. I mean, I, I more have questions for you guys. <laughs> well, that's all uh, right. We'll have a conversation. But what we, we want to know as a fan who you want. And let's start with that. You want Syndergaard and Stroman. Why do you want Syndergaard and Stroman? Because that's not a slam dunk for everybody. So make well, the case. <clears throat> I mean, they're uh i understand that you know uh people are going to offer them boatloads of money um so it's going to be you know that kind of situation so i I could see them disappearing to some team for 50 billion dollars but um i don't know they're both just uh you know cool king lords you know badass king lords of the mound um you know, Stroman is, you know, it'll always be like pretty much like two runs every game, you know, six innings, two runs, whatever. I, I don't know. He just seems super reliable having a guy like that. And he's cool. And Syndergaard is also very cool. And, you know, like when you see Moneyball, it's like he's got a good face, he's got a good, good abs. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, the things the things that don't really matter anymore, but used to for some reason to to scouts. But you like that intangible. That's thought, what you, you want that with these guys. It sounds like. Well, I assumed that was about selling tickets, but was that literally just about like confidence or something? I don't, anyway, side note. That's just I mean side train. I don't want to derail. Um, no, I think okay. My two players that I would I mean Syndergaard and Stroman are the obvious one. But for me, I feel like Jeff McNeil, I don't know what his situation is. I am i don't think his contract is up. I don't really know. But he just seems like one of the more kind of clutch, like big moments, like he's come through a lot this season. And I just feel like getting rid of him for some accidental reason would really bum me out. He's probably my favorite player on the team right now. Just because I just feel like he just seems like he cares a lot or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I think, but actually my favorite player is actually Miguel Castro, the the bullpen guy. I feel like, uh, he's just the coolest dude in baseball, maybe. And, um, I mean, he throws a hundred miles an hour. He's got like, you know, what slider change up fastball. He's got all these, he's just like, he's just the dream, uh, pitcher for me. So I feel like they already have their, you know, set up, man, if, if they wanted, so for me, it's like eighth and ninth inning is it's already taken care of, you know, between Diaz and Castro. And then all they really need is, I don't know, I missed Hansel Robles, remember? I feel like he was cool. <laughs> With the point up to this guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Maybe first he could have the seventh and then we're done. A couple of the things you're saying May are fascinating cool to me. Because May is of cool. how, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. because, because of how uh, big of a Met fan you are. First of all, I think Miguel Castro is cool too. I think the fact that he has hands about the size of six baseballs and can throw <laughs> anything he wants at any time is awesome. And I will say that your, your Mets fans out there are about ready to move on from Edwin Diaz. It seems like maybe, maybe that's a skewed perception, but you, you want the ninth inning to be his moving forward, Julian? I mean, he's, yeah, yeah, I think he's pretty legit. I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, who, who else? I mean, unless, you're, unless it would actually be Castro, um, I don't see who else. You're, you're talking about like, fight, like going and getting one? I mean, he seems cool to me. Well, Andy would know better than I would, but guys like McNeil and, and, and Diaz, because you've mentioned both of them are, I, I would think potential trade pieces for them this offseason. No. <laughs> well, that's a good, it's a good visceral reaction. I mean, look, I, I think in this case, Julian, in, in this, the, you know, the Mets are looking for a new president of baseball, which you probably know that you can consider this your interview because you're answering the kind of questions that will be asked by Steve Cohen and Sandy. Alderson. Harold Reynolds. Yeah. Harold Reynolds is your president of baseball. Well, that's interesting. Why don't you make a case for that? Well, I'll get into what the other players you said later, but you're throwing out the name Harold Reynolds. That's actually a guy that the Mets had in mind for a possible GM before they hired Brody Van Wagen. And why, why do you love want Harold Reynolds, Reynolds of all people? I don't know. I just think he's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's obviously the way things translate from TV analysts to, to, to real inside an organization is, you know, it, hit or miss but um to me he just seems like he's got a really thoughtful cool baseball mind and he just seems like i don't know also even if he was like you know manager one day or something i don't know he just looks like he'd look good in a met uniform and um <laughs> i don't know well, i just if, think uh, it, sorry to interrupt you but if i may you see there seems to be a common link between some of the guys you, you're you're highlighting players who perform well of course who you want to keep uh Syndergaard being somewhat of an exception because he hasn't pitched in two years we've performed well in the past but there's also seems like a certain like swagger persona that that you're looking for or quality of being some kind of a character because you're identifying some guys 100%. with strong personalities and, and i think that's a piece that we and being close to covering the team can miss. We focus on production and maybe not so much that entertainment value. seems like that's important to you as a fan. I mean, that's, that's one of the main things I was actually thinking before we spoke that I feel like that's such a big part of the Mets. You know, that's what I feel like, you know, especially like 86 Mets probably or 80, you know, four, 85, 86. I, I think um, th that's what the Mets have they they represent that like kind of aspect i think of new york in a way and i think that always gets missed when when they sign players or, or, or trade players or get rid of players there's certain players who just kind of they fit they're like corky or, or whatever you know it's like uh, i can't think of the, like rascals i don't know the right word like mm -hmm. not bad news bears but there's this kind of element of like you know like cocky or um you know kind of like badass but not traditional or something i don't know so um i'm not saying it well but i think y'all know what i'm talking about probably yeah. better than i'm saying it but yeah i think that needs to be part of the equation and and for sure is is missed sometimes and that's that's wrong i think if you're gonna be building the mets because it's just built in genetically it, it's like a subconscious thing you can't even quantify it's like once you're there and you're in new york and you're just you know playing and then the crowd is there there's something you feel that either you're like this is this is what i was made for and this is my time or this is my vibe or like i'm an alien what is this i don't get this and i think that needs to be you know uh thought of carefully by, by the way well, before gets, before it, before andy jumps in i just want to give our listeners <clears throat> the visual idea that um julian is gesturing over the skyline of new york because he's joining us on a rooftop so as he was just talking about New York City and what it means to people. He was uh, physically gesturing around the city, which was a cool visual. And by the way, Andy, before you jump in, it's crazy how, um, I mean, I don't think this is a coincidence, but how relevant what Julian's saying about New York is because we've been talking about New York as this like media capital, but in reality, he's right that 
just being in the presence of New York City and playing here, you either dig it or you don't. And maybe the, maybe the mm-hmm. kind of uh, underrated cool factor is something we should focus more on a little bit. And Julian, also, if I may, it's, it sounds like you're drawing a difference between the Yankees and the Mets that way, which kind of totally, gets me. Totally. Yeah, which, yeah. Well, if you can expand on that, like what you're a New York kid originally, you could have chosen in the 80s either the Yankees or the Mets. What was it that drew you to the Mets? And could was I it have, this kind of quality? Could I have, though? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, as you guys, I mean, most of the people I know and, and, and friends are Yankee fans, I guess. Uh, I I found more Mets fans over the years, but I think there is a different energy. I mean, honestly, now at this point with the payrolls, maybe the Mets are have lost that a little bit because there is so much money there. It used to be just like the Yankees could afford everyone. And then the Mets were kind of like, you know, halfway down or whatever. But I think that's changed with the money aspect. But um, I think just the energy, there are certain players you just feel like, oh, that guy seems like a Yankee or that guy seems like, you know, a Met or something. And and, and sometimes they seem to kind of get it wrong and it's, and it's interesting. And um, and I feel like um, the Yankees have a little bit of this kind of like cyborg-y. I think it's, it's, it's almost more about the fans than the team itself. I mean, there is like a, a look and, and, and I get it. It's like, we're number one and it's like, but there's a little bit of a, sometimes like a condescending uh, pride with the Yankee fans. And I think Mets are more kind of like, you know, self-loathing um, <laughs> kind of like, we know we're like not the best, but it's, it, it's more like comeback energy. And it's more like, you know, Star Wars for lack of a better word. You know, it's just kind of underdog, the odds are down. Can we defeat? You know, can we can we win against incredible odds in this kind of like quirky way? I guess for lack of a better word. But um, and I think the Mets are kind of like, you know, the NYPD or like you know, it's kind of this like army of organized, well-funded. You know, uh, it's like you know more serious, and you know, obviously all the evil empire analogies. So it's like, do you want to be part of the rebellion or part of the empire? And I think in sports, a lot of times people are looking to, you know, escape reality or just kind of have like a fun thing. So they want to be part of the winning team. And I think that's why the Yankees attract, you know, like Manchester United, and all these kind of like, you know, teams that win a lot, you know, just people like that. And I get that. And the Mets are not that. The Mets are, is the, you know, Bernie Sanders underdog um, more like original spirit gonna you know win the day and finally you know uh change the status quo a little bit i think that's that's a way of kind of symbolically explaining mm-hmm. it maybe where, where does lindor fit in on that to you is he is he had the met vibe in your way because he's gonna be around another decade and he's kind of the face of things where are you on that <laughs> oh man yeah that's um that's an interesting question I mean, what I mean, what can I say? They've given him so much money. Um, it's funny when I explained to my son how much they paid him, he was very confused. Um, well, just I think he's you know he's young and he just didn't understand how I think how much baseball players make. It is kind of um, and I and you know obviously he's had a rough you know beginning of the season, so he he kind of like he he was paying attention more to stats this year than anything. So that's a bad example. I think. Okay, I think anyone can, I think he has the potential, whatever. I don't want to comment too much. I think, honestly, I didn't want to comment on any uh, any negative, I should say, because, you know, anyone who's on the team, it's like, you know, we all love them all and, you know, we wish them to, 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 you know, become the biggest super legends of all time. But I don't love the giant contracts in general. I've never have. I don't get it. I mean, you can give someone a big contract, but just the long term, insane amount of money contracts, even, you know, I love um, in the Bills quarterback, um, Josh uh, Allen. Allen. Yeah, yeah, Josh Allen, I think. But, you know, when they once the, when they gave, gave him that contract, it's like, it's like, how do you how do you even still try? <laughs> do you know what I mean with that? It's like, uh, I think Colin Kaepernick was another one. I mean, obviously, he's this, you know, political figure. And so people might not understand what I'm saying. But even before all the political stuff, I mean, I think that was like his plan B. 
in life because, you know, playing didn't seem to be the thing anymore. Once you get that much money, it's like, what do you, do I want to get hit by 500 pounds, you know, superhumans? Um, no, I think I just want to, you know, live on a yacht or go to cool parties. I don't know. I mean, it's just the psychology of giving someone $300 million and then saying, I want you to, you know, do this really tough labor intensive job. There's something there that is weird. And I think maybe he's got that work ethic and uh, can, can, can buck that trend. And some people have, I think, maybe, I don't know. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but um, I don't love the big contracts. Like yeah, it's tough psychologically. I think, I think you make a point that there when, are... for someone to live under that kind of pressure, and I think Lindor... Like many, guy, many I mean, the three, home runs against the, the three home runs against the Yankees. I mean, that bottom, what, like that's $50 million right there. So he only, he only <laughs> owes about 290. You can knock 50 off the contract right there. I mean, that was, I think he has the potential, you know, him and Baez, I think have this huge potential, but um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's my thought. There are many, many, many more long, expensive contracts that we could point to that have not worked out Julian than the ones that have. I mean, Max Scherzer is an example of somebody who's earned every, every penny, but you know, that's, that comes to mind quickly because it's not Miguel Cabrera or Albert Pujols or this long list of guys who, you know, are great players having great careers, but we're, we're paid kind of for what they did, not, not what they will do. Um, and I do think it's interesting. Like, do you think there's any correlation between what you're saying about the, the motivation of an athlete that uh, you know from your experience being a performing artist and that you probably know people who've taken a residency in Vegas and made a huge payday and their uh, motivation maybe to create, to grind, to come up with new work and new ideas kind of takes a back seat. Do you think your perspective on this with professional athletes is unique given your unique perspective on life and what you do? I, uh, I don't, uh, yes, but not necessarily with, with money in that way. I think um, there's a correlation, I think, with, uh, I mean, money is part of it, but I would say stardom or, I don't, or legend status maybe is, is a better way of saying it. Like, um, you know, I think, people who become legends in their own time sometimes have a real problem. Uh, it's almost like when, when, a, when, a, when an artist uh, will fade a little bit into obscurity or something, sometimes they have more longevity. But when they're just, you know, king shit of, I don't know, can I curse on this? There's no rules. You know, it's like David Bowie, Prince, people like that, I think when they were in their later years, they're just such legends. I don't know if they could really kind of recapture that old, you know, level of, of uh, when they were younger, because I, I think they just, they could, you know, they could just kind of, for lack of a better word, I don't know, you know, they could just kind of like take a dump in the middle of the room and, and people would just be like, oh my God, it's so amazing. <laughs> and so I think when you kind of live in that aura for so long, not the, sorry, I'm just, I don't know why I'm saying all this foul stuff but my point is i'm bad at expressing myself my point is um yeah when you reach that kind of there's no way to kind of even gauge where you're at because there's just going to be this ocean of you know um uh, validation i think that's that's a tough current to swim against in terms of finding the quality that you once had I think that articulates uh, what I've experienced with athletes who achieve that status really well. And that must be something that has to do with fame and recognition and success and money and all those things, regardless of what your, what your chosen field is, because it's probably difficult to replicate the hunger that got you there once you're already seen in that way. And it, with players who get big contracts, I think, I think that can happen too. Good question, Doug. Crossover question. Well, you know, I try. I try to be a professional. I think. In my I line think there's. Work. I think there's. Um, there's a place though because there are big contracts, and and I think, 
but but if you but when a when a player makes you know let's say I don't know twenty million dollars or you know even though that's an insane amount of money I think in their mind they're, they're imagining okay if I live lavishly I could run out of money in ten years and I think they just they keep that like oh man I gotta it's just they don't need like full on like you know they're sixteen and and they gotta like make it they don't necessarily need that level it's just once you hit that kind of super you know, comfort, and there's no way you're ever going to spend that money in your lifetime. I think it's different than, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying, I think, mm -hmm. right? Again, I'm not saying it well, but psychically, maybe <laughs> conveying it. I, 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 think it I think, I think, yeah, I think you're conveying it. And I'm, you know, I'm connecting dots because I've been thinking about the Jerry Seinfeld routine since you've been talking about kind of that feel of being a Met where Jerry always says, you know, you're rooting for laundry. Right. And and fans get fans get so attached to the players in uniform, even though very few of them are from New York, you know, and that kind yeah. of it, it comes back to why are we fans? Right. But I'm I'm reading kind of your email, Julian, and some of the names that you mentioned in terms of people that you find interesting. Jazz Chisholm, um, Joey Votto, Zach Grinke, all of these guys are quirky to your earlier word, but also just really unique personalities. And I mm -hmm. think part of what you're saying, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that when you say watch the documentary about the 86 Mets, the personality is why we're still talking about it. So yeah. it, it matters for, for the sake of what it feels like in the moment, but also for the sake of history and how they're remembered. You're not making just like a fun, hey, I love the Mets. I want them to have interesting players point. It ends up being a, a really telling um, part of what the, how the franchise is viewed. And I think a lot of people listening are going to feel what you're saying. Yeah. Um, agreed. <laughs> I think uh, I didn't realize that, that was going to be sent. It's funny. I, I wrote those notes for myself and I was going to, yeah, simplify it, but um, some of it. Anyway, yeah, I, it's cool that you saw that list. Yeah, I mean, Wheeler, I think, was on that list. That that one, like, can we get him back somehow? Because that just hurts. It's almost like it would be better if he was a terrible player on the Mets than good somewhere else. Because I just remember hearing his name for, like, 17 years. And then it was just like, okay, you know, Zach Wheeler, fine. You know, I get it. Everyone's excited. And now just like seeing him do well somewhere else, it's like, what the hell was the point of that? Why did we like talk about him for 25 years? And now he's like, you know, literally beating us like on our wild card competitor or, you know, whatever, the, you know, NL East, like he's on the Phillies, right? I don't even remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the unique misery of being the Met fan in that case, right? Is that he that ends one, up on come your on, rival. come back, Zach Wheeler, just... <laughs> Come he was on. fun Can to watch, and in, in an understated way, he was a character of on his own. He was quiet and not and certainly flamboyant in any way, but he had his, his own kind of vibe and strong personality that I think fans seem to connect with. Or maybe just uh, maybe he's just like a Justin Turner spirit or something. Yeah, well, that's another one. His personality oh, yeah. only flowered in, in L.A., so that's, a, that's an yeah. interesting one, too. Um, Julian, quickly, before we let you go, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to, what you're creating and, um, how you're spending your time other than, uh, you know, torturing yourself with these Mets games. It's funny. I got, I got, I kind of, I mean, I've spoken about it before. I kind of try not to really watch sports, but I think my, my kids have kind of like pulled me back into the, you know, following a little bit, you know, my son's always asking me a little bit score and stuff. Um, he likes the Brewers too. Good, good for him. Um, Yelich is another big favorite. Um, I think I'm just, uh, you know, always just juggling a lot of things. I mean, COVID, everyone's kind of waiting. Releasing music, I think, is, you know, everyone's kind of waiting for touring to be back. So I'm just a bunch of music I've been working on, but uh, nothing really this minute, to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, politics is interesting and depressing. And what the hell is going on in 2021? It's uh, super kind of intense and insane. And, uh, but, you know, someone's some we've all got to try to be informed, I think, educate ourselves and all that, because I don't know. It's um, 
it, it's 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 just everything is is pretty surreal right now almost more than the height of the pandemic um coming out of it is almost a stranger moment to me um so i don't know so yeah just uh, you know working on the usual and you know trying to tend with the unusual well we that that's all true and well said and we had you here to talk baseball and, and not your music of course your other projects so <clears> you <throat> should know that we certainly are fans of your music and the that's only fine. Whatever. and the only thing that we wanted to leave you on on a non-baseball note is just to ask you if you could recall the set list from um on march 15th 1996 just pipe played at the spiral on, on east houston do you remember wow. do you remember the, <laughs> how did you interested. find that <laughs> my, that's not real is it did you No, make it's that? real it? it's real my wife went to high school with nick nick valencia's sister and they went together to this show and she, when uh, i when i told her what we were doing um i played she, guitar yeah. at that show did you <laughs> yeah. were you singing yet or were you just a guitar player <laughs> i was singing but i was also playing the guitar wow you remember that show they specifically to, yeah sure the, well, the spiral was kind of uh, it was known because you could book <laughs> you could book a show there without having like a demo tape. All you had to do was just call up. <laughs> so that was like kind of everyone's first show in New York was usually the spiral. And uh, yeah, I remember. Um, I think I, I threw up before the show <laughs> in front of like four people. Um, and yeah, it was a different on. lineup and. Uh, uh, Nikolai, who plays the bass in the Strokes, he came up and did like a poetry singing thing over like like Doors instrumental type song. Oh man, yeah, that was uh, yeah, it was, that's blast from the past. Wow, thank you. There you go. Well, you remember more about it than my wife, who just remembered that the uh, her main memory was the drummer was cute. Um, I'm not sure if that was Fab or if that was a different. You said it was a different lineup, but whoever he was, uh, it was Fab. You, it was Fab. Well, tell him Obviously. that um, he was cute that day. Um, and I, I gotta before we let you go, I have to mention that I share a, a love of the song "Out of the Blue" with my father, and I want. I told him that I would thank you for that uh, oh, on this cool. podcast and mention it. It is. Um, he first played it for me. I think when I was in high school or college and you know it's in spotify every year in my top 50 uh, oh, played it's survived the years i i truly love that song so julian so, um thank, thank you, you for all that you've created for our listeners for us and thank you for coming on and talking some mets with us this has been, been such a cool experience and it's it's nice meeting you via zoom and great talking mess with you so thanks. this has been great julian thank you yeah, nice meeting you guys too. Maybe uh, in person at a game or whatever sometime in the near future. Yeah, we'd thanks like for having me. See you, Bye. Julian. All right, our thanks once again to Julian. That was really cool. And you're listening to the Shane Anything Podcast brought to you by Verizon. 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Leave it to a, a rock star to keep apologizing for the way he's putting things. But you and I were just listening like, whoa. Yeah, it was <laughs> like, good. It was like, you're more articulate than you think you are. So... Help, yeah, and he even listen to even this like, and yours just say like it, it all made perfect sense. Even like a, a pregnant pause is is cooler when y- you have interesting things to say. You know, yeah. if 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 we spoke like that, I'd be like, uh, all right, but like that's true. It, it's just I couldn't wait to hear how he was gonna describe both his Mets fandom and then so cool for you to have that flyer. Um, yeah. and what great for you that you ended up with your wife, Ruby, instead of Ruby marrying the guitarist or no, the drummer, the drummer, the drummer fab was, he was cute. Then I'm cute. Now it all works out. Yeah. Good for Ruby. Um, so I want to, Andy, you've written, um, a column late last week about Rojas and Boone, which, um, I thought was interesting. I agree with your sentiment that you know, New York is uh, a specifically difficult place to renew a contract because that information becomes public. And when, you know, a manager is up, uh, Mm -hmm. you have to re-sign that guy, which seems like a vote of confidence. Mm -hmm. It is, but it's also like, if you think you have a good manager, just because you re-sign him doesn't mean 
you think he did everything well and that the season was a success, but that's how fans will read it. Anyway, long story short, um, where does Louis Rojas fit in, in your thinking? And do you think that the Mets, whether it's Sandy Alderson, Steve Cohen, or anyone in that front office right now, do you think that they view him in a favorable light, even the way this season has gone? I think it's going to be very, 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 very hard to swim upstream against the perception you just talked about, which I think is really stupid that you have to be good every year, especially in a contract year. And if the team's not good, it's the manager's fault. Um, in other markets, you can have down years and it's not this whole, your team can. And if in the front office has the freedom to sort of say, well, we don't think the manager was the cause of this. Let's keep going. I'm not exactly sure how many contracts Bob Melvin's had offhand with Oakland. He's been there for a decade. Um, but he's considered one of the best managers in the game easily could be manager of the Mets next year. If things break a certain way, mm-hmm. um, what would break, Melvin's, that would be a Billy bean, Billy Bob Melvin. Here. Yeah. Yeah. That could happen. Ken Rosenthal first floated that. And I can tell you that's a possibility. Okay. Um, but just to make my point, um, since he's been there in Oakland, 70, he did the amount of wins and, and I'm just going to read out some wins in seasons, consecutive seasons from 2011, 74, 94, 96, 88, 68, 69, 75, 97. What does that tell you? That tells you he's had the freedom to manage a team or the latitude to manage a team with some good years and some bad years because they know he's good. So just stay and be part of the solution. And it's very unfortunate for Boone and Rojas that that's not really a thing in New York. That's what I'll, that, that's what I'll say. So the, the latitude, do you think that um, when Melvin makes a, an in-game move that doesn't end up working, that it counts as much against him as it would a manager in New York? Absolutely not. There isn't nearly that level of analysis. And look, that's why New York, it's not all bad. Like, it, it means that the fans are smart and they care and they know the game. And, and But it, sometimes it also means it's just – jerks on the radio or wherever on Twitter that are like overdoing it with one particular move and getting angry, like little babies about it. Um, Like that part is like not giving people managers the room to breathe, to become good managers here. So what's going to happen is I bet Louis Rojas is going to have a, if he's given the opportunity and have a successful run managing a team in a different market. And the Mets are going to be like, we had him. Uh, and you don't, it, it's all going to play out that way, I bet. And it's not necessary for it to play out that way, except for the fact that that's the way it goes. I noticed that um, Bridge Rowley wrote a column um, nationally for The Athletic with a line in there that I think you retweeted, mm-hmm. uh, quoting, which was from an industry source that, you know, a lot of people in, around the league believe that if Rojas is not retained as the Mets manager, that he'll rebound quickly. That's true. And, it's a Mets loss ultimately. And, you know, I, I think for anybody listening who, you know, is frustrated about the way the Mets season has gone. First of all, I don't blame you. Second of all, that's just human nature. You're a Mets fan and you're listening to the Shane and podcast. So you want the Mets to do well and they haven't this year. They've underachieved. But think about the, the, the opinion that Andy just, uh, Andy just presented. And then think about um, what Britt's saying, which is that around baseball, Rojas is viewed as a really good candidate. If he weren't yes. currently, a, if he weren't currently a manager, he'd be on teams short lists uh, going into next season. Just like, for example, Jeremy Hafner was a good get as a pitching coach for the Mets. He was on a short list for a lot of teams who knew he was an up and coming pitching coach. Rojas is probably viewed that way because teams around the league don't overreact to pulling a, a pitcher after six or maybe using Aaron loop for a few too meant too few pitches. Like every manager makes in game mistakes. And a lot of times you'll, you'll, a team will come to town like the Oakland A's and you'll be like, okay, it's going to be cool to watch the best manager, one of the best managers in the big leagues. And he makes a move that makes you shake your head. Yeah. 162 games is a long time. The best managers aren't perfect. And by the way, whoever mm-hmm. the Mets bring in will be in the hot seat in two years again. Because be in the hot seat in game number one when he makes a pitching right. change that doesn't make perfect sense. And there are because it's not about we'll them. Yeah. It's not, we don't, it's not about the manager. That's not how we view it. There will be nobody perfect. Right. You would and, I mean, everyone listening yeah. would view Casey Stengel differently if he managed today. And when and when Rojas has the Padres in the NLCS next year. 
<laughs> It'll be what it is. I mean, yeah, Padres are a good example, Andy. We don't talk about that market, so I don't know enough to say, but it sounds like Jace Tingler might be on his way out. And I wonder if that's this situation or if he has some real issues because that he could, was a- that we couldn't say, but we are right. We, right. we, we don't have, we don't know that market, but I will tell you that when Luis Rojas has the team in the NLCS next year and everyone's singing his praises, the Mets are going to say, we had that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you for, for listening as always to this episode of the chain ending podcast, a reminder that you uh, can subscribe rate and review. And we ask that you please do on Apple podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening and chain innings brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right from the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Our thanks again to Julian Casablanca. So that was kind of a thrill for us, honestly. Uh, very cool to talk Mets and a little bit about his career. Andy, thank you as always. Uh, we'll be back with you later this week with Jerry Blevins, who happens to be making his uh, pregame and postgame debut on SNY this week. So we wish Jerry all the best of luck. Everybody should watch. And uh, we'll talk to you in a couple of days. 